Welcome to the Roy Morgan Retail Business Address. Shortly, I'll introduce Laura DeMarcy, our guru on everything retail here at Roy Morgan. Laura's going to deliver the Retail Business Address for 2024. Then I'll introduce a lively conversation that Paul Zara, CEO of the Australian Retailers Association and I had earlier today. So let me now introduce Laura DeMarcy. Thanks, Michelle. We all know that 2024 is shaping up to be a challenging year for retail as sales flatten amid the continuing cost of living crisis and the holding pattern mortgage holders remain in. Today, I'm going to take you on a journey through how Australians are coping and what they're telling us about how they're adapting their spending, along with the surprise winners in this environment. Today, you'll discover Record population growth is doing the heavy lifting in keeping Australia out of recession. The cost of living crisis is hitting young families the most. But other key cohorts still have spending power. Consumers report spending less on some categories, but more on others. And there are surprise winners in this environment who are disrupting retail to the tune of $8 billion. Rewinding to early 2023, we feared Australia was on track for a recession as close to 1 million mortgages came out of fixed interest rate periods and another half a million to come over 2024. We all know that this worst case scenario didn't come to pass. Why? Because of record population growth. Net migration added more than half a million people to our population which did the heavy lifting to avoid the much feared retail spending cliff and of course, recession. Meanwhile, consumer confidence continues to hover around historic lows with the indicators sitting below 80 for much of 2023 and that's unheard of. However, in the first quarter of 2024, some green shoots are appearing with the index now finally above 80 marking a turning point as Australians become more hopeful that the rate rise cycle could finally be coming to an end. Not surprisingly, among mortgage holders who represent more than a third of the population, consumer confidence has been hit the hardest, down 21 points since April 2022. At the same time, financial stress has increased among mortgage holders over this period as more people struggle to pay bills and regular expenses. The extreme end of this, mortgage stress, calculated from Roy Morgan's deep data on loans, income and expenditure, is also hovering at a record high. Now 31.4% of Australian mortgage holders are at risk of mortgage stress. Not surprisingly, those most likely to be at risk are recent mortgage holders, those who've had their mortgages for six years or less, and single income households. So how is this affecting retail? Sales continue to remain flat, with households saving less and having less of their income to spend. On this chart, the blue line shows the household savings ratio plummeting at the end of last year, to roughly half of what it was before COVID. The green line shows retail sales. The relationship between these two is clear as the savings ratio declines because the cost of living eats up more of people's discretionary income, retail sales slow. So far, the picture is looking pretty grim, but it's important to remember that interest rates don't directly affect everyone there are still co cohorts with spending power. People who own their homes outright represent 34% of the population, a significant cohort whose spending power is unaffected. In addition, many young adults are also free from the burden of rents and mortgages, with just over half of those aged 18 to 29 still living at home with their parents. And this represents a significant generational change in Australia's demographics. Let's take a closer look at what consumers are telling us about how they are adjusting their retail spending. 
The ABS reports that retail sales are down by close to 1% year on year on the non-food categories. Australian consumers are also telling Roy Morgan that they've reined in their spending by about 4% less on those non-food categories. Who reined in their spending the most? 25 to 34 year olds, especially parents of children under 16, whose spending dropped by 15%. This is more than enough to shift the needle at the overall level when you consider that this cohort represents 4.3 million Australians. Looking at individual categories now, consumers reined in their spending on those categories centered around the home, with the biggest drops seen for TV and home theater, baby and nursery products, and home decor. But not all retail categories declined. Several bucked the trend, with pet supplies and gaming gaining double-digit growth. And cosmetics, perfumes and skincare were not that far behind. Even though Australians report reducing their overall spending year on year, spending online did go up, especially in the last six months. Dollars spent online are up 12% in the six months to March 2024, compared to the previous six months. Now that's partly boosted by Black Friday sales, but also driving this increase are just three retail brands. And they are Amazon, Shein and Timu. All three are thriving in this environment with $8 billion in combined annual sales. Let's start with Amazon. While other retailers are struggling to maintain sales, Amazon is flying, almost doubling its customer base in Australia in three years. Year on year, Amazon sales are up 6%. And in the last six months to March 2024, it also enjoyed exceptional growth of 17% on the previous six months. Currently, 3.4 million Australians shop on Amazon in an average month, helping the online giant reach $5.6 billion in sales in Australia. Astonishingly, Amazon now commands almost a tenth of all the retail dollars spent online in Australia. Amazon is now in the top five retailers in the country for non-food categories, not far behind Juggernauts, Kmart, Bunnings and Big W. Books and electrical goods are Amazon's biggest categories. So who's driving Amazon's success in Australia? Well, the answer is a mix of everybody, not just bargain shoppers. Some of the key cohorts shopping on Amazon include young families, big spenders and neos who are the most valuable consumers in the economy. These groups are all more likely to shop on Amazon than the average Australian. And Amazon's rise is set to continue with one in two Australians visiting every month. Last week, Amazon also announced plans for a new mega warehouse to accommodate larger items such as furniture and large electrical which pretty much guarantees their expansion and ramps up their status as a threat to most Australian retailers. The cost of living crisis has created a perfect storm for the phenomenal rise of ultra cheap Chinese platforms, Sheen and Timu, which now have 2 million Australian shoppers each month. Timu particularly has caught everybody by surprise coming literally out of nowhere to win 1.4 million shoppers in an average month, putting it on track to earn $1.4 billion in sales. Incredibly, Timu now has as many or more customers as some of our biggest national retailers, including those you see on the screen. Much of Sheen and Timu's success in Australia is a result of massive media investment and social media marketing, which has driven unparalleled levels of brand awareness and trialling for these once little known online platforms. Timu is reported to have spent three to $4 billion on marketing in 2023 globally. 
As a result, now 91% of online shoppers are aware of Timu and 70% of Shein, motivating huge numbers of people to trial them. Women's clothing is by far the biggest category on both Shein and Timu. Half a million people buy on Timu each month and more than 700,000 on Shein. Critically, in a very difficult retail environment, Shein and Timu pose a direct challenge to established retail brands and not just discount stores. Shoppers of all the brands you see on the screen are more likely than the average Australian to shop on Timu and Shein. So who is driving this phenomenal rise and why? Much like Amazon, a mix of Australians are shopping on both Shein and Timu, but there are some key cohorts driving the rise. Young families, always keen to make their dollars stretch further, are more likely to shop on Shein, along with larger households. What's really interesting is that older and retired Australians are also more likely to shop on Timu. When we asked people why they shopped on Shein and Timu, price and an extensive product range were the big drivers, no surprises. But not everyone is happy with the quality of products arriving at their door. Many are deciding never to shop with them again. Others are feeling uneasy about the ethics of ultra cheap retail. As these research participants put it, Sheen is the best and worst of disposable fashion. And of Timo, it exploits slave labour and manipulates people into thinking they are winning like gambling. Amid the rise of ultra cheap throwaway retail, a trend in the opposite direction quietly continues. 57% of Australians buy secondhand and 44% sell items that they no longer want or need. Together, they make up the circular economy, defined as people who do both. So that's 7.3 million people buying and selling on the secondhand market. When we ask consumers why they buy secondhand, the desire to shop more sustainably remains a key driver, on top of cheap prices, of course. But some told us that buying secondhand has become a necessity over the last year, that they can't afford to buy items new because of the cost of living right now. Now we're going to take a look at how retail performed in the latest Roy Morgan Trust and Distrust rankings. At Roy Morgan, we ask Australians which brands they trust and which brands they distrust. And crucially, we ask why they trust and distrust the brands they nominated. Retail still dominates the most trusted brands list, but shifts are underway. Distrust of the major supermarkets is growing and rapidly. As a result, Coles and Woolworths are falling quickly down the rankings due to perceptions of price gouging and profit obsession. We expect them to drop right out of the top 20 most trusted list by the end of the month. Now looking at the most distrusted brands. Only two of the top 20 most distrusted brands are retailers, including Amazon, but more about them in a moment. Price hikes and profit focus are the key drivers of distrust. Zooming in on retail brands only now, the top 20 most trusted retailers is again dominated by Bunnings, retaking the number one ranking by delivering on the core drivers of trust, reliability, consistency, good products, great service and helpful staff. When we look at distrust among retailers, Amazon is the most distrusted brand in Australia, despite its huge growth in customer numbers and also ramping up customer support. But we're seeing significant improvements in Amazon's levels of distrust, so they may indeed drop out of the top six list soon. Sheen and Timu also make it onto this list, driven by the reasons we saw earlier, poor product quality and unethical practices. So what does the coming year hold for retail sales? Let's take a look at our forecast. 2024 is set to be another transition year as we continue to navigate the COVID hangover, shaped by the cost of living pressures. 
Roy Morgan forecasts a continued flattening of retail sales for the next 12 months. However, the second half of the year may see more money back in consumers' pockets to drive further growth. And that's thanks to moderating inflation, those stage three tax cuts that everybody's waiting for, which some analysts are forecasting will equate to a 1% increase in incomes at the total level. In addition, we have potential interest rate cuts coming down the line towards the end of the year and a drop in retail electricity prices from July, following a drop in the wholesale cost of energy. So what can we learn from these trends to help navigate the rest of 2024? Amazon is a powerhouse and a real threat, putting more pressure on retailers to perform on price, ranging and fast delivery. Along with the critical role of paid membership programs, Amazon Prime, in staying at the top of the consideration set. Timu and Sheen are thriving amid the cost of living crisis, but their future is unknown as we wait to see if poor quality and ethical concerns drive customers away. In the meantime, Australian retailers can learn from their playbook. Firstly, there's a very real market for ultra cheap retail in Australia now, and many more people are willing to trade down in quality for price. Buying customers via media spend really does work and it works very quickly. The gamification of online shopping also really works. There's a strong opportunity to go into in the opposite direction, however, and take the premium moral high ground, meaning ramp up your credentials around quality, ethics and authenticity. That brings my address to an end. Now it's back to you, Michelle. Thanks, Laura. That was excellent and scary. Now let's turn to the conversation I had earlier with Paul Zara. So let's get started. And the first flow really flows from these existential threats that we saw in Laura's presentation. The question is, a recent KPMG retail report said a whole bunch of things, but they said retailers should know when to quit. <laughs> so Paul, is it time for many retailers to quit the industry? <laughs> Well, that's a, I'm not sure we'd want any retailers to quit. So I think um, uh, the best way to answer that is that the retail industry has always been competitive. It's always had new entrants. It's always been challenging. And if you speak to a retailer, they'll always say, this has just been the hardest year I've ever had. Yeah, and even exactly. in good times, they, they're complaining. So I, I guess um, uh, you know, it, it comes back to the fact that um, the, the challenge of a, a retailer is, to, is this whole process of reinvention. So you're always going to have these challenges where you have to continue to reinvent yourself. You can't really rest on your laurels because nothing stays the same. Now, nobody ever would imagine that Team and Sheen, and I'm with Laura, I, I didn't know who, <laughs> I got a media query first up, I think about um, eight weeks ago before your research, and I didn't even know who they were. Um, and in fact, it had to go off and do, do the research. So it does mean that you've got to realise we're always going to be open to, new, to entrance, and it's a changing landscape and the consumer is changing consistently. So what we're seeing right now is that the consumer is completely under uh, um, this cost of, I like to use cost of living crunch rather than crisis. I think Ukraine's a crisis, the Middle East is a crisis, but what we're seeing here at the moment is a real crunch around that household dollar. And I think it's important to know that, um, you know, that the consumer is changing and they're looking for different things and not all retailers are giving them what they want. Thanks, Paul. Um, can I just add to that? I think, you know, is it time to quit? I think if you're in the business of retail just to make money, you're probably an institution. And I think the institutional money will follow the money and some of that might leave. But if you're in the business of retail because you love it, you'll actually find a way and there will be huge opportunities. They'll be different, as you say, Paul. And, you know, clearly if we didn't see Sheehan and Timu coming, 
We can't tell you what all those opportunities are, but they will be there in this changing environment. And that's a really good point, Michelle. I might just add to that. I think those companies, there are companies that are just so focused on shareholder return yep. that are now getting exposed. And I think that's because the customer is not being looked after. I mean, there's, two, there's three, uh, four key stakeholders when you think about it. It's the, and this is the best retailers deliver on four. It, it's the shareholder, it's the supplier, their supplier uh, partners, it's their employees and it's their customer. And we may, I'll use a non-retail example, that way I won't get shot to death, but I think if you think about what Qantas has gone through recently where they've been really focused on the shareholder versus the other elements, that's where you, you get exposed. In a, in a world now of transparency where all information is available and people can actually see right through a brand rather than just the advertising. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So this is a very broad question that I'm sure you've been asked before. What does the future of retail look like? Now, let me start by saying that retail in 10 or even five years could look very different. You've already said that. So the emergence of what I call industry killers, not the category killers of the 1970s, 80s or 90s, but these industry killers coming mainly from China do threaten to change the entire game. So what do you think it will look like in the future? Well, let's, that's a really, these are all really good questions. Obviously I'm not a futurist, but I do know that we've, um, you know, we, those re, the, the retail operates in cycles. You know, there's an up cycle, there's a down cycle, and there's constantly, and, and the issue right now, we've got this collision of a cost of living crisis, or a cost of living crunch, and a cost of doing business crunch that's happening at the same time. On top of that, you've got this um, really major foreign um, entrant that's coming through. Uh, it does force retailers to, not again rest on their laurels. And that's what we, we get to talk about Amazon a little bit. I think what Amazon did do, it actually did ask, get force the Australian retailers to lift their game in many ways. Whoever even would have imagined next day delivery or same day delivery if it wasn't for Amazon. So you sort of got to put that into, into yeah. perspective. So when you wind forward that the retailers are under pressure as they always have been, and it's because they've got rising costs. At the moment, they've got declining sales. And if I take my department store history, you sort of needed to roughly get a 3% sales increase to cover your 3% cost increases. Well, that's completely been blown out of the water recently. It's like 5 to 10% in some cases. So we're not going to see 10% increases in sales, um, not even in food. Um, so retailers have to be forced to look at, uh, it's a batten down the hatches, how do we do things better, and the solution's all in technology. So let's talk about that a little bit, because if you sort of wind forward, there's no doubt artificial intelligence is going to make, make a huge part to play in, in retail, because it does two things. It does improve service, because technology will always, in, in many cases, I know this is a bizarre thing, but technology <laughs> has got a better chance of giving correct information to customers than a sales assistant's going to ever do. Yeah. Uh, they also, it's, it's also got the ability to reduce costs. So when you look at AI particularly, that's where if, you, if those retailers that embrace it will actually look at improving the service experience, reducing costs, and that's a great over, overall view. We have, you know, in our current, um, you know, there's a, if you're in, those, those of you that are dealing in industrial relations law know that um, particularly under the current government, labour costs are going to continue to go up and up and up and, and we have to, curtail, with our productivity improvements, so we've always said we're happy to pay our people more but they've, we've got to see productivity improvements but we're not seeing that. So that's where technology does kick in and of course if you're opening a warehouse tomorrow, it's 100% yeah, or 90%. People, no, you're filling it with robotics and, and yeah. that's, the, that's the future. Given, given all of this yes. we're hearing about online and you yes. know robotics in stores and all, all of that stuff, should the government introduce tax breaks for physical store retailers as an incentive it's, to keep it's going? It's a good question. Of course the government gave us tax cuts, we'd take them. So <laughs> we would take them any time. But um, we don't think, in a retail community today, we don't think between well, are you a physical store or you're an online store? We, we think of ourselves as being omni-channel. You have to be omni-channel to be successful. Um, and we should talk about Amazon because they're not omni-channel. Um, but the, um, the fact, the, the, the best retailers in the world are omni-channel. They um, tend um, to, uh, because if you think about COVID, everyone at the time when uh, online was coming to fruition, saw online trading and digital trading as a major disruption. But today we see it as an insurance plan because if you didn't have an online store, you wouldn't have been able to trade through the COVID years. So um, I think, you know, when you, when you think about all, all in all, it's, um, you know, from a tax perspective, 
you'd want to see uh, tax breaks for innovation and technology investment more than anything else. So then those physical stores can get that sort of insurance plan. Wow, I normally yeah. vaguely agree with Paul, but not on this one. <laughs> okay. Well, look, I think physical stores are a difficult one because nobody shops in one channel anymore. So you sort of can't protect one channel. I think that's, that's my point. You've got to, you know, I think most retailers are, are reducing their physical footprint. Uh, they're investing heavily in digital, and that's really where we want to get to. When you look at look at Amazon, and they've been super successful. We don't know their profit, by the way. That's the other piece to yeah, this. They're only seeing revenue, um, but the most successful, profitable retailers are omnichannel retailers. Right. Interesting. If I care about the world, I would hate to see a world without shops, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree. <laughs> and I would hate to see a world that didn't employ people. So I'm for re reducing the tax or removing tax I am from too, most I am people. Too. Good, right. I won't. Well, I think take, take the physical store for a moment. I think um, it's so important that we remain, and look, small business particularly, I mean, there's a lot of large businesses here today, but if you take small business particularly, you know, for if you t we wind back to those COVID years, it was only those shop fronts that played the major part in the community for people to connect. They were often the only person, people that we would see during the day if we were to race out and get a loaf of bread, etc. They play a huge part. Now, I think the thing about the retail industry, it's such a visual statement. When we're doing well, it's visually appetising yes. when you walk past the store. When we're not doing so well and there's for lease signs, it's a very strong statement against around what's happening in the economy. Absolutely. Now I agree with you, Paul. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. We got um, there. Okay, fine, final question. Yes. Is this the worst time ever to be a retailer? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't think and then there's, we're going to throw it open <laughs> to the, to the I'm group. not sure there's ever a really good time to be a retailer. I think, you know, um, uh, even – let's take a look at the poor supermarkets who have done really, really well. And these are, this is the thing. If you're a Coles or Woolworths right now, they are really – hurting reputationally, yes. um, particularly Woolworths. And I think even though they've done well, what they were thinking at a time, most if you wind back about a few years ago, maybe not even that, 12 months ago, everyone would be lauded over the results of Coles and Woolworths. But now that the tide has turned, different government, different political settings, um, and I think it's different always context, tough. Different context, yeah. um, and I think consumers have actually, so there's a backlash uh, there that's ha that's happened and I think you know it's always tough to be a retailer I often think of it slightly different to say would you wake up <laughs> would you encourage your own child to open up a shop tomorrow as part of their future plan highly unlikely I think you've answered the question <laughs> yes. no now have we got some any questions from the audience hello um, well you meant our figures show that the we suggest retail sales will go up one percent next year yes. but if you take into account inflation and population growth are you worried that in real terms per head retail sales are going to decline next year Look, I think it's a really good good question and consideration. We, we don't see any um, relief this year at all, full stop. So even though the tax cuts will come through, and we, there's lots still to be positive about. The tax cuts are coming through. Most Australians see their value in their, their homes, which we didn't speak about, but Laura um, touched on the um, the tax cut side of it. And we're seeing our housing prices going up. There's general, you know, we're all in, in jobs, we have full employment. There's a lot of positives. But I think this it's a cultural piece around people looking for value just generally that will be slightly embedded for definitely for the rest of this year. I think we'll see some relief if we get to, to Christmas, but if you're a retailer right now, it doesn't matter where you're, whether you were, you know, David Jones or the reject shop, it's all about value. And you can see how even a premium department store is being impacted. Uh, it's, it's really about value. Even the rich want to save because it's what everybody said we should do. So those, they, they're still spending, but they're also looking, looking for value. I'm hoping that 1% does translate. I think the piece in there, it's it's what's up for grabs maybe the way I would describe it. But I think we're also competing if you're a merchandise retailer with services because I think um, there'll be a, 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 a probably a move to doing more, more service related um, things, possibly travel, possibly other things that people have been holding off for. And that's what we, we need to sort of see, see play out. But I think that whole circular economy piece is a big shift in consumer attitude mm. that retailers need to be aware of. If you, those of you that have been to Selfridges in, the, in London, they've actually opened up a whole shop around return, customers yeah. being able to return goods, get them mended to sell secondhand goods. Who would have ever thought a department store would sell secondhand goods like this? But that's what's happening. And we're seeing that mm. now coming to Australia. 
So homeowners represent 34% of the population but are contributing almost half of the spend on travel in Australia right now. That's interesting. And half. the other thing from that, mm. Laura, I thought was interesting from your... Um, uh, the beauty about running a premium department store previously, the trends were really... I'm seeing a lot of the trends through the GFC replay and what we saw, because you said across so many categories, look, in the history of um, a downturn in spending, 75% of discretionary spend is done by women. That's a fact. It's around 75%. And the, the trends generally, which is what we, um, Laura, put up on the board, is that uh, women will stop shopping for the home first. And that's what we saw. The home category just plummeted immediately. Now, on top of that, during COVID, that's where we spent our money because we had nowhere else to, to do with it. Then we see the next category that actually um, that fell over <laughs> was actually men's fashion. So um, women stopped, buying for, stopped buying for the men. And then the next category were kids. And then the last category were the women's category. And what you've seen up there is, in fact, the cosmetic department is going gangbusters. <laughs> So it's, it's, these aren't sexist comments, believe me, they're just comments around, they actually are. around, in fact, <laughs> the power of, um, of, a, of, the, of the female shopping dollar and what's happening. So the reality is, of course, it's easier to um, get a new lipstick and that way you update your wardrobe immediately without having to spend a lot of money. And those categories are in some ways are yeah. recession proof and they continue. So there are categories that are still winners through here. Um, that you're seeing that are continuing to perform. And in fact, in the luxury end, in my experience, that customer has n no tie to what's going on in the economy and they just continue yeah. to spend and there's continue to be double digit growth. Laura made the point earlier, I just want to make sure that we remember the group of people that have been most hard hit in this in economy are young families, particularly with children and they're young, low income families with children. And you know, what's really important about that is if we look at the way that the wealth is distributed in Australia and always has been, it's the young families with kids that are negative. So, you know, people living at home is fine. Everything's sort of taken care of more or less. You go out and do, you've got a job, but you don't have much, too much responsibility. Then along come the children you then know what expenses are. Mm. You've possibly bought a house, in which case you've got a mortgage, or maybe you haven't bought a house, in which case you've got rent. And then you've got these little monkeys that need clothes, they need stuff, you can't go to work as much, you've got to worry about this. It goes negative. So these people have got like a double, triple, quadruple whammy, and they really are bringing things down. And I guess, I don't have children, but I'm guessing there's this emotional stress too, because if, you know, Little Missy wants something, you say, it's hard to say no, right? So uh, that's that pressure around what families have to go little through. Mister the too, so uh, little, little Mr. Little Mr. Mr. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is incredibly important to realise this. Not everyone's poor. Mm. Not everyone's um, feeling the cost of living crunch. There's another thing that Ross Honeywell talks about quite often, narrative economics. The narrative today is the cost of living crisis. Even if you've got you know, two incomes doing really well, you're still surrounded by the conversation about cost of living crisis is having an impact. So we have to remember that and we have to remember that we're not all needing to support the bottom end. And in fact, government policy is doing a lot of work to support those lower income families with children and retail doesn't have to stop because that group is in, um, in real strife. No other questions? No? I think we're done. It's Paul, thank you. I love the fact that we don't always agree. Thanks very much, Paul.